The program you are about to watch is part of a free series we are making available to you as a gift from Greg Fritz Ministries, entitled, Saying What God Said. Visit gregfritz.org to download the MP3s and watch the streaming video for free by entering code FREE at checkout. Are you tired of hearing bad news? Tune into the good news of the gospel. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. Hello, I'm Greg Fritz. Welcome to the Good News program. We're continuing our series, Saying What God Said. And if you have not yet gotten the study notes, I would love to encourage you to do that. We have these available on our website. You can download all the outline for the entire teaching. This is going to be 15 sessions, and we'd love for you to get those study notes. And we also have it available in video streaming. You can go stream the, the videos. They're on our website absolutely free or you can download the mp3 audio and put it on your device and we also have it available in a bundle on a usb and we'll tell you more about that later uh, but we are talking about confession and the faith confession has been a subject that has been one of controversy and if you came through the 80s and 90s and the word of faith teaching movement then you're familiar with some of these terms. And if you didn't, uh, there is a truth here that we need to recognize. It was abused and mocked and criticized and maybe misused in the past, but there is a truth to faith's confession that is so important that as I've uh, been teaching on faith for the last several months, I didn't want to conclude my faith teaching without including this part, this uh, faith's confession. Is it really important? What is it and how does it work? Um, and, and really, I'm, I'm answering the question today, uh, does it really matter what you say? Is it really important? Or is this something that faith preachers just have told us because that's their subject and that's their thing? Or is there really a biblical application and a biblical proof uh, biblical scriptures to prove that your words count, that they really matter. You know, most people have so little uh, respect or appreciation for themselves I I as a whole. You know, when you look at the world as a whole and then you look at your part in the world, we seem so small and, and, and uh, you know, insignificant. But it really does matter what you say and it matters in your world because all of us are creating our own way, our own world that we live in, and our words have a lot to do with that. In fact, if you go uh, to Hebrews 11, and we'll go back there. We've c covered this a couple of times, but I want to go, go back and start in Hebrews 11, verse 1. The whole topic here is faith, and in verse 1 it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. So you can see here he opens with how important faith is. Then in verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. The obvious subject here is faith. But he's saying what he's trying to show us is that God used faith and words to create the universe. He said the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. The obvious implication here is that we're supposed to copy and follow God in this principle, the principle of faith. Just like the heroes of faith that are mentioned later on in this chapter, they all practice the principles of faith well, he's saying we got all this from God. God is the original faith God, and he created the universe with faith words. Or he says, by faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. So if God framed the world with his words, you can frame your world with your words. And in that sense, he's saying you need to do this. You need to exercise the principles of faith and faith is made up of two parts. First of all, you believe in your heart. Secondly, you say it with your mouth. 
So without the confession of faith, you don't have real Bible faith. Even God himself used these principles. In other words, if anybody could do faith without words, it would be God. God should be able to just do whatever he wants any way he wants to. But he didn't just sit on his throne and believe the universe into being without words. He said, let there be light. Let the earth bring forth in abundance. He spoke these things. He said these things with his own mouth. And he is the, the original faith God. And Abraham followed him. And all the other heroes of faith that followed God, they did the same thing so that uh, Paul, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 13, we have the same spirit of faith as they had. They believed and they spoke. We believe and we speak. So throughout the word of God, starting here in Hebrews 11 with God's original act, which was creating the universe, you see believing in the heart and speaking with the mouth. God didn't say, it sure is dark out here. You know, I wish there was light or he didn't just say whatever he felt or whatever he wanted to say. He needed light and so he confessed light. He spoke light so that the things which are seen, what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is the things you see came from a world that's unseen. The way to bring things into being, into manifestation in our natural world is words. The entire natural world came into being through words. So your words can change your world. That's why Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, whoever says to this mountain, that's the world, that is a, a, a something in this world that needs to change. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes those things which he says, he will have whatsoever he says. So he's saying the same thing that Hebrews is saying is there, your world is framed, your world is created, your world is changed by the words of your mouth. This is not some faith preacher of the 80s and 90s. These are scriptures in the Bible. So the principles of faith have been taught in the Bible from the beginning. Let's look at Proverbs 21. I want to give you one more of these Proverbs before we go on and look at some other instances that prove to us that it matters what you say. Your words count. Proverbs 21, 23 says, Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps his soul from troubles. One translation says, Guard your mouth and your tongue and you'll keep out of trouble. The Jerusalem Bible says, He who keeps watch over his mouth and his tongue preserves himself from disaster. So evidently your words can help you. They can save you. They can rescue you. They can keep you from harm. And this is not some faith preacher saying this. This is Proverbs. This is Old Testament. It's been in your Bible all along. The Good News Bible says if you want to stay out of trouble, be careful what you say. And if you look at this like it was written in Hebrews, that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, you can readily see that he's not saying, if you don't talk nice, God's going to get you. You're going to suffer retribution if you don't say the right things. That's not the context at all. He's saying you're literally creating your world, you're paving your own road with your own words. It's not like God's out to get you if you don't talk right. That's not where it comes from. We're simply creating our surroundings with our words. God created the universe by saying, let there be light. He's, he created the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. He created it all by words. And you're creating realities in your life by your words. One writer said, you'll never rise above your confession. So if your life is limited, look at what you're saying. Because you can increase your limits by changing the words that are coming out of your mouth. One more. Uh, this is Proverbs 21, 23. One more translation. Moffat's translation says, He who is careful of his lips and tongue will manage to keep clear of trouble. I like that. You can stout a trouble 
by watching your words. And, you know, I studied this years ago. I came into it thinking I was just a young Christian, a young preacher, and I had heard a lot of different teachers and teaching on confession. And I had the idea, you know, that God knows my heart and He knows I love Him. He knows that my motives are, are right and, and pure. I'm not perfect, but I love God and He loves me and I know that. I have a healthy relationship with God. And as I heard confession, I thought, you know, they're putting too much emphasis on this. God knows what I need. He knows what I want. And He knows what I mean. And, and, and it's not that important what I say one way or the other. And I decided to go to the Bible and prove for myself that, you know, how important is this confession part of faith? Is it really that important? As long as I get it right that confess Jesus as Lord of my life, does it really matter after that what I say? And, you know, I found out through the scriptures, through some that I've shared with you today and some that I've shared in previous sessions, that confession is more important than I even thought it was. It's so vital that we follow our faith, the faith in our heart, with the words of our mouth, that if we don't do this, we're undermining our faith. We are, we are working against ourselves. Anytime you contradict God's promises with your words, you're getting into unbelief. And I, I spent two whole sessions on the children of Israel in Numbers 13, when they were going into the promised land or supposed to go in, they sent the spies. And all they did was talk about what they had seen and what they felt and what they thought was going to happen. They just talked. And, and, you know, they had been delivered from Egypt. God had brought them a long way. He had provided water from a rock. He'd done miracles on Pharaoh and his army to destroy them and to rescue the children of Israel. He had gotten them to this point. And on this day, all they were doing was talking. They were God's people. And they had God's promises, and they began to talk. And, they, and, and, and most of the children of Israel on that day talked themselves out of the blessings of God. Joshua and Caleb said, we can do it. Let's go do it. Let's possess the land. God's given us the land. But all that happened was talking, and yet they were determining their destiny. They were determining their future. Because later on, God said, as you've spoken... If so, I'll do it according to what you've spoken. I'm going to do what I've heard you speak in my ears. And so the majority of them did not get to go into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb, they did because they said what God said. They agreed with God in their confession. So does it matter what they said? It certainly did. It cost them their future. It cost them the blessings of God. I like to say it this way. Uh, God called it unbelief. And if unbelief kept them out of God's promises, unbelief will keep us out of God's promises. If you want to counteract that, then walk by faith. You can enter in by faith. And faith is made up of two parts. You believe the promises of God in your heart, and you confess them with your mouth. So uh, you can reverse the example that we saw there in Numbers 13 by simply saying what God said about your situation. Let me give you a couple more. 1 Peter 3.10 says this way, For he that loves life, that will love life and see good days. How many of you want to have life that you love and see good days? Well, all of us want that. Well, here's the recipe. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. So uh, here again, he's, he's uh, making a connection between the life that you live, the world that you have built for yourself, and the words that you've spoken. We can literally change our world by, by our words. And, you know... I have so many examples of this that I don't have time to repeat them all today, but it's so important to get this point. This is not a works program. Uh, God's not going to get you. If, you. if you say the wrong thing, that's not what we're saying at all. We're saying that you can use your words, your authority, faith in God's word. You can put that in your mouth and speak it. You know, Jesus didn't say, if you don't speak to your mountain, sooner or later, 
I'll move it for you. That's not what he said. He said, if you will speak to your mountain, it will obey you because you'll have what you say. So those are scriptures that, you know, they're really not, not negotiable. They're not deniable. It's there in the Bible. Jesus wouldn't have told us to speak to the mountain if uh, we couldn't do that, if we couldn't change things in our lives. And of course, we don't need to move literal mountains, but they represent things in your life that are immovable, that are in your way, that are insurmountable. He says you can believe in your heart and you can speak with your mouth and things in your world will change. And, uh, you know, like I said, I tried to go to the Bible and prove that it wasn't that important what you say, but that's not what you see in the Bible. You see just the opposite. You see a high level of importance attached to the words you speak. Let me say it this way. You'll never be able to live in victory if you talk defeat. You say, but I believe in victory. I believe God wants me to be an overcomer. I know the scriptures and, I, and the pastor just preached on it and I agreed with it. Well, all that's good. But if you talk defeat, you're not completing the faith process. You're not really acting on your faith. You're not bringing corresponding action to your faith. And, and you're not bringing those things into being or into manifestation with your words like you're supposed to do. You can't walk in victory and talk defeat. Say, why not? Well, that's unbelief. Unbelief is not just, just doubting in your heart, but it also has to do with the words of your mouth. You can undermine the things you say you believe by your daily confession, the things you talk about day in and day out. This is not something you just do once and, and then go back to your old confession. In other words, you can't, you can't speak healing on Sunday and then speak sickness and disease Monday through Saturday and expect to be healed and expect for healing to manifest in your body. It's not something that you just do once and then forget about it. Confession is an ongoing thing. That's why it's, it's the part of faith that we need to remind ourselves of. Because you can start out really good and strong in the area of confession and then just completely go off the rails. You can be very disciplined with your tongue for a period of time and then give in to doubt and unbelief and feelings and completely miss it. And so it, that's the part of faith that gets away from us the quickest. We'll end up doing what James said, and out of the same mouth will proceed blessings and cursings. And he said, these things ought not to be so. That's not how it's supposed to work. You're not supposed to speak healing one day and sickness the next day. And if you do that, that's being unstable and double-minded, and your faith's just not going to work. Look at this in, in Luke chapter 8. Let's go there and, and we'll look at their confession here and show you that words really do matter. In Luke chapter 8, and this is the story of the storm, uh, when Jesus and the disciples got in the boat to go across the Sea of Galilee and a storm arose in the verse 23, as they sailed, um, he fell asleep and a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and they were in jeopardy. And they awoke him, saying, verse 24, now notice, all they did, other than get in the boat, the only thing the disciples did in this whole account is they said something. And they only said one thing. They said, because all the rest of the time Jesus was asleep. So they, they only had one statement to make, and here's the statement. Master, Master, we are perishing. Now, this is after Jesus said, get in the boat, let's go to the other side. That was the word of God. That was the will of God. That was the plan of God to go to the other side. So they got in the boat and the storm was so severe that they quit believing they were going to make it to the other side. They quit believing the plan of God, the promise of God, the word of God, and they began to believe they were going to die. And how did they express all of this? In words. Does it really matter what you say? Well, let me ask you this. Did it matter what they said? They only said one thing. Master, Master, we are perishing. Then Jesus arose, rebuked the wind, the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And then Jesus said to them, Where's your faith? 
Now, how did Jesus know that they didn't have faith? How did he know they were in such unbelief? Because of what they said. There, there was, there, it was easy to de determine where they, he could locate them by their words. I mean, think about it. So there's 100%. There's God said, let's go over to the other side. That's God's word. That's God's will. That's where you're headed. And they were not even at 50%. They weren't even at, we might still make it. They were down here at zero. We are dying. They didn't just believe that. They didn't just think it. They said it. And because they said those words, Jesus said, where's your faith? How could they have brought faith into the situation? For one thing, they didn't need to say what they said. For the other thing, they could have said something that agreed with what God said. You see, they totally disagreed with God. They contradicted God, just like the children of Israel in Numbers 13, who said, we are not able to possess the land. God said, I'm giving you the land. They said, we can't possess the land. That is a direct contradiction to what God said, and that's unbelief. How did all that come to pass? By their words. And in this case, God said, let's go over to the other side. That wasn't a suggestion. That wasn't a dream. That wasn't fantasy. That was the word of God. The next thing we hear them saying is, Master, Master, we are all going to die. Well, that is directly contradictory to what God said. Or in other words, that's unbelief. Now, when you look at it in this context, and you might think, well, they were scared and it was a real storm. And I understand all that. I'm not the one that was disappointed in their response. I think it's a totally natural response. If the boat's sinking, I mean, that's what you say when boats are sinking. But that was not what God expected. And his standard is the one we need to go by. Jesus said, where is your faith? He was so disappointed in them. Now, how could they have turned that around? And why were they so obviously in unbelief? Because what they said, it totally contradicted what God said. So they should have said something like, we're still going to make it. We're not going to die. God's still on the throne. We're going to make it. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it. Or something more in line with what God said instead of totally contradicting it. Now, you would be surprised how many Christians believe so many right things. And if you had told the, asked the disciples, does God love you? Yes. Do you love God? Yes. Is God on, on the throne? Yes. Is it God's will for you to go to the other side? Yes. Uh, does God keep his promises? Oh, yeah, God keeps his promises. So what's the problem? Well, we're going to die. Uh, there's a storm here, and we're going to die. That's just the way it is. They had no idea that they were contradicting God and coming against God's promises. People live that way. Christians live that way all the time. They believe the right things about God, that he's a healer, that he's a deliverer, that he prospers, that, that he's, you know, an overcomer, that he wants us to overcome. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. They believe all of that in theory, but the entire week they confess and make statements that are in, in direct opposition. I'm weak. I'm sick. I'm poor, I'm broke, I'm confused, I don't know where to go, I don't know what to do. And they think that that's totally fine. But according to God's definition of faith and unbelief, that's unbelief. It's doubt. And you can't make headway in the, in the, in the area of faith when your words contradict the promises of God. It's just that simple. It's not legalism. God's not out to get you if you don't say things right. You're not offending God if you don't agree with Him. You're just giving up your right to enjoy the promises of God when you don't confirm them with your words. So, Joel 3.10, let the weak say, I sure feel weak. No! Let the weak say, man, this is a terrible day. I just haven't done anything. No, let the weak say, I am strong. Now, why do you do that? Because if you're weak, you need to change the situation. You need to move a mountain. You need to calm a storm. You need to exercise some faith. And the way to do that is with your words. And especially if you've heard these promises, if you consider yourself 
full gospel, you have these truths, you have these promises in your heart, and you do believe them. But when you allow your words to agree with situations, circumstances, and symptoms, you're going to find yourself contradicting the promises of God, and then faith is not going to work. These are simple principles, but there's just not an exception to it, you know. And I know God loves you and you're special, but nobody gets to, nobody gets to take a shortcut. Faith works the same way for everyone. You believe it in your heart and you say it with your mouth. Um, th there's so many, there's so many different other examples in the Bible of this. Um, I'll give you one more proverb. It says in Proverbs 6, 2, Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. And so that's all I'm saying is if, if your faith's not working for you, if you're not happy with the world that you're living in, maybe it's your words that have gotten you to this place and you didn't realize it. Maybe you just thought it was normal and right to say what you feel and to say what you see. But that will never change your circumstances. To change your world, to, to cause your world to be uh, the, the product of things that are not seen, the way God did the universe, you do it with words. You begin to speak your faith, not what you see and feel, but you speak what God said in the situation. So you speak strength in the midst of weakness. You speak healing in the midst of sickness and disease. You speak life in the midst of death. You speak victory in the midst of defeat. And you stand strong on the Word of God. And don't ever contradict God's Word with your words. And I'll tell you, it is like a rudder. Your tongue's like a rudder on a ship. It'll change the direction of your life. Well, I hope you got something out of that. We're going to continue this teaching. My next section, you're going to love this. I've entitled it, You Have What You Say. And that's so good. You're going to love this. The Bible didn't say you had what you believed or you have what your enemies say you have. It said you have what you say. And you know who said that? Jesus did. And we're going to look at that in the next uh, session. You don't want to miss that. Thanks for being with us today. We're all out of time. Um, make sure and, and make time for the rest of these teachings. They will change your life. And until our next episode, remember this, the good news is so good, the bad news doesn't matter. Learn what true biblical confession is and what it is not in this new series. To order your copy of this series, call our helpline at 918-749-7744 Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time. I'd like to invite you to check out our website. We've put a lot of time and effort into improving it, and I know you're going to love it. We got all kinds of material there to help feed your faith. We've, it serves as a hub to our other social media platforms and our other outlets. You can go find our podcast, our YouTube channel. You can follow us on Facebook, all through the website. So go visit gregfritz.org today, and I have a special intro video for you on the home page. I'll be looking for you there.